In unit three, we'll focus on programming, which will be the most intense unit that we've seen so far. So there will be a lot of time needed to be spent on this lesson, but we're going to break it up into various small lessons that will build upon each other. The first thing that you may want to tell your students, and, and some of this slide uh, material could actually go earlier in the course, but I just presented it in, presented it in this section, is uh, an overview of hardware and software. I find it actually somewhat amazing that when I go into a high school and I ask for students to give me the definition of software, or even to give me examples of software, they often cannot define that or provide an adequate example. So often students will mix up hard hardware and software together. So just being able to, at the very onset, describe those differences could be helpful. So hardware, you can mention to your students, is anything that you can touch. So any device from a monitor to the computer to a keyboard or mouse. And software then represents abstractions. We'll talk about abstractions later, but software is more of an idea. It's not something that we can touch. So it's a set of logical constructions and a set of different commands that we can tell that tells a computer what to do. So software is manifested by writing programs and those are written by software developers. And um, surprisingly, you know, we need to make sure that students understand this definition before we move on. And you might even mention this in the very first lecture of your uh, class. So we can then talk about um, what software is and how software is developed and the relationship with software and programming languages. So software is written or creatively expressed in a programming language. And programming languages have grammar, uh, which are rules related to the syntax. So students remember from their English classes diagramming sentences. Now, the same way that students parse the meaning of an English sentence a programming language also needs to be parsed according to its proper syntax. And we'll talk later about syntax errors. A programming language also has semantics. So each part of the language has special constructs or special words that mean specific things. So a correct program then is a set of instructions that is in a specific language and a sequence of, of various instructions can then correctly describe the logic of a specific need of the program. So a third point to emphasize is the logic of the program. So the syntax, the semantics, and the logic. And we can have an error with each one of those. I'm mean, talking about computer languages. So computers themselves only understand machine code, which is just a series of binary sequences. So a programming language is useful for humans to be able to write and express their thoughts at a higher level. So there's two ways that we can convert the higher level language of a human usage in terms of writing programs down to the machine code. So there's two translators, a compiler and an interpreter, where a compiler will take the human program and translate it directly or generate the code for a specific machine. And an interpreter kind of works by taking the program and modifying it into something that can be executed on the machine as well. So both of these translators can identify errors in the program, syntax errors, particularly in a program. And after a program has been translated by, say, a compiler, then we can execute that program onto the particular computer that we're working with. So the topic of storage is also important. So computers receive input, then they process, and then they produce output. So in that whole flow, there may be computations that need to be performed at intermediate steps within the program and values from those computations need to be placed somewhere that they can be used elsewhere in the program to perform the computation. So when a program is running, it's making use often of internal storage or random access memory in, in the common case. So random access memory is volatile memory. So when we turn the computer off, that kind of memory is gone. There's also read-only memory, and read-only memory is not volatile. So it's, it's there even after the power is gone. And Read-only memory is often useful for, for things like giving instructions on how a computer is to start itself, where a RAM will, st will store the program and the user's data and so on. And because RAM is volatile, we need a way to store information that the program is processing so that we can access it later when the computer is turned back on. So being able to have external storage such as a hard drive or be able to use a USB stick and burning CDs or DVDs is important external storage. So there are five phases to software development in general. And the first is being able to understand what the user wants. So being able to 
you look at the requirements that the user has, and then from those requirements, develop a plan. So perform a design and consider the logic of the program before we actually get to coding. So coding is implementing the solution, and a lot of times students want to jump right to coding. We want to emphasize why that's not, not the best idea at times. Then after we have the um, solution performed and implemented, we want to test the program. And then finally, we deploy the program by sending it to the user and we maintain it. So these five steps actually parallel, if you're a mathematics teacher, some of the things that George Puglia talks about in his famous book, How to Solve It. So that's one of my favorite books and uh, tells how to solve a mathematical problem. And that same, those same steps you'll find in Puglia's book as you find here in, in the generalized steps for writing software. So the idea of understanding the problem is perhaps one of the hardest parts of writing software. And this is due to several reasons. The user, for example, may have a vague understanding of their own needs, or the user may change their needs midstream, which happens a lot. So a good software developer must play multiple roles. They must be a counselor in understanding what the intention of the user uh, might be. They need to be detected to undercover certain things that may be assumptions on the user's part, but not explicitly stated. And they also have to be an engineer, know how to plan and put that logic together for the solution. So when we're planning as a software developer our design, we have several steps that we need to follow. And sometimes those are described with flowcharts or pseudocode. There are a few CS principles pilots that are using this. Some do not. But rather than spending an extra lesson on that, I'm going to refer you to a really good video on flowcharts and pseudocode and ask you to consider this and show this to your students as well about how to design or, or show how a solution might be designed without actually getting into the code. So both of these involve using English and natural language to describe something about the design of the actual solution. So the importance of planning can be seen here on this slide. There's the case for even non-trivial programs, such as professional developers may be creating. It's very important to go through all the phases that we just talked about. Uh, those will be manifested in various ways, but th that was still the general five steps that would be, be useful. So in the same way that when students write a good term paper, they have to plan and sketch out and draft before they just start writing often. So the same kind of thing is useful for writing software. Otherwise, we end up with a, a big pile of spaghetti. So um, I'm not sure what kind of award we have, but I'd like to make a challenge to the whole class. If anyone can tell me who this is in this photo right here, just place a post out on Piazza. So just kind of a, a random challenge to see who's able to get to this particular lesson and discover this. Who is the person that's photographed here on this slide? So the importance of planning can even be seen in very simple things, such as planning a doghouse. So building a doghouse even takes some engineering and design. So I'm not much of a Mr. Fix-It person, so using hammers and saws and so on is kind of dangerous for me, so I need really strong guidance when I'm building something like this. So this is a, a plan that I found for building a doghouse, and you can see it's really explicit and precise, even for something that should be simple. Plans like this are helpful. So the next few slides will show us some examples of some things where poor planning led to some disastrous or almost comical results. If you ever have a chance to go out to Silicon Valley in San Jose, I suggest you take a visit to the Winchester Mystery House. This is a really strange oddity, and it all came about from the heir of the Winchester rifle, Sarah Winchester, believed that she was being haunted by spirits, and she actually went to a fortune teller or a medium who told her that in order to appease the spirit, she had to continually build on her house. So for decades, she hired people to just randomly build things on her house. So no planning, just, you know, whatever the need was that day, let's go ahead and just add it to the structure. So you have doors that open to walls and windows in the middle of a room and staircases that just go to the ceiling. So that's kind of a, a funny example if you visit that place, but if we write our software like that, that'll cause airplanes to fall out of the sky. And other kinds of things that are disastrous in terms of planning is not knowing all the environmental conditions in which your software might need to perform. So there's a famous example of the T Tacoma Narrows Bridge, and there's YouTube videos of this bridge collapsing, and it's all about the failure of the engineers to understand all the external factors on their system during requirements and design. 
Somewhat humorous is this example of a street corner with various telephone poles and electricity wires coming into a central place. And there's been no planning here for how these wires connect to each other. It's just, you know, whoever put this together just randomly hacked out a solution. And uh, I would not want to be the person in the middle of the night called to fix a power outage in this place. So I would be a bit afraid to stick my hands in that type of rat's nest. But that's also how software is sometimes built. So just poor planning and just ad hoc adding things together without any forethought. A very expensive example is the Arian 5. So you can refer to your students to the URLs here at the bottom. And there's a YouTube video of this crash. So the Arian 5 was just a failure to understand how software was to be reused. And there was a very detailed analysis of this failure that students could read about. But it's just another example about, of, of issues of requirements and design and how that leads to failures in the implementation. So again, the ability to plan and design is very important before we get to coding up the problem. So after we have the requirements and the plan in place, we can go ahead and begin to uh, code up the solution. So the solutions that we write for software are coded up in programming languages. So common languages such as C++, Java, or Python. In this course, in just a few lessons, we'll talk about Snap as an example. And so that's a language that a, a human can understand very well and that we code up our solutions. There's also various tools available to software developers. There's code editors where we actually write our program. Debuggers help us to find logic errors in our programs and even tools to help us test our programs. And when these things are integrated together, we call that an integrated development environment. So after our software has been developed or implemented, we then need to test it. So testing is important to help us to reveal any logic errors that might be manifest in our code. So the way testing works is that we take the actual program and run the program and observe the results. And we compare those results to expected results that we are assuming that the program will provide. And if those expected results are not the same as the actual results, and there's likely a logical error that we need to discover. So logic errors are programs that are syntactically correct, but their meaning is not what we intended. And one form of a logic error, a runtime error, can actually cause our program to crash. So if we're not able to recover from that, you know, there could be a disaster. The final phase to discuss is deployment and maintenance. So deployment means simply to place the program out into the field with the user. So installing the program could take various forms of just installing a single program for one user compared to installing a large program for a big corporation. So deploying is that type of installation and making sure all the programs, the databases, and all the things needed for the software is in place. And so a legacy system is when we have a software system that's been in the field for a long time, and it's becoming increasingly costly to maintain it. So sometimes we will then migrate and create a new solution. And this often happens, for example, in bank mergers. So when banks merge, these two information systems need to be combined, and one legacy system needs to be merged with another. And so we, we have these needs to, to maintain our software as well. And users may also come up with new requirements. So we need to adapt our software, adaptive maintenance. And perfective maintenance is just fixing mistakes in our program that we discover later. So this is just an overview of the software development process, independent of any programming uh, topics. But we think that your students should hear this so that they understand that computer science, when we write software, is just not about going straight to the code. So in the next lesson, we will do that by starting um, an introduction to SNAP. And most of the, the future lessons will often be screenshots where I will show you on my screen various programs that we'll write together. So that's what we'll cover coming up in lesson two of unit three.